Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Compliance Week. I'm Matt Kelly, editor of Compliance Week, and we're here today for a somewhat special event, uh, a discussion on the future of corporate audit committees and how they oversee the annual external audit. And to talk about that, we have some very informed guests. We also will have some fresh data to present to you, the listeners, about what in-house compliance and audit executives are bringing to the audit committee to help manage the relationship with the audit firm, and also uh, lots of data on what audit committees themselves are disclosing to investors and the public about how they are working with the audit firm. Uh, there's going to be a lot of ground to cover. So our partners in the discussion today will be uh, from the Center for Audit Quality and Audit Analytics. Before we hear from our guests, uh, let me quickly go over the agenda for this afternoon. Uh, we're scheduled to go for one hour. I'm going to give a very brief introduction here, and then we'll jump right into the presentation after that. Uh, the presentation will then be followed by a Q&A session. Your questions will be confidential and anonymous, so please don't be shy. Uh, you can ask questions at any time using the Ask a Question function on the left-hand side of your screen. I will save those up, and then I will pose them to our guests after they have done their presentations. And then after the Q&A, I will wrap up the webcast for the day. Now, this webcast will offer CPE credit for all attendees as well. Uh, to get the CPE credit, uh, please disable the pop-up blockers in your web browser so you can access the exam. Uh, how this will work is when the webcast is completely over and I sign off, at that point, the final exam will present itself automatically in a separate window on your computer screen. Uh, and again, you have to make sure that your pop-up blockers are disabled for that to happen. You can then take the test. Uh, if you have any trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving a CPE certificate after you take it, please send an email to info at compliancesweek.com to request a copy, and we will get one out to you by email uh, within 24 hours or so. And if uh, you didn't catch any of these instructions just now, don't worry. I will repeat them at the end of the webcast, so stay tuned. Uh, a few other administrative details. At any time during this presentation, listeners can also download the slides from the drop-down menu on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can hit the View Slide Full Screen button at the top of your screen if you wish to increase the slide size. Uh, and lastly, a Help button is located in the upper right-hand corner for any other assistance you might have, and someone will follow up with you. Uh, so today's webcast, this is part of a series that Compliance Week launched a few years ago. We hold these webcasts just about every week, usually on Thursdays, and our guests have been chief compliance and audit executives at large public companies, uh, as well as various experts on compliance, audit, and risk management like uh, the people who are joining us today. I won't read the upcoming schedule of our webcasts here and now, but if you'd like to see what is coming up on deck, uh, you can visit compliancesweek.com for details about our webcasts to register for any of them. Uh, in addition, if you would like some old school in-person discussion, uh, just an idea, consider coming to our annual conference that is happening later on this spring in Washington, D.C., May 18 to 20. Uh, we usually have 500 or so senior level compliance, audit, and risk professionals in attendance uh, from large companies all over the world. And what we talk about there in person is generally a lot like the topics you hear discussed on these webcasts here. Uh, so if you are interested in our annual conference, just give it a thought. Uh, please visit our conference website at conference.compliancesweek.com uh, for details about the agenda and uh, to register. And certainly we hope to see you there. Uh, so now let's get on with our program for today. Uh, we have several guests here today. Our main guests are Cindy Fornelli. She is director of the Center for Audit Quality. Uh, Cindy, hello. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to it. And also joining us is Mark Cheffers. He is chief executive of Audit Analytics. Uh, Mark, welcome to you too. Thanks, Matt. It's a delightful to be here. All right. So here's what we're going to do with Mark and Cindy for the hour. Um, the CAQ and Audit Analytics have been working since last year on a project known as the Audit Transparency Barometer, uh, where they were looking at what disclosures about audit engagements companies make to the investing public. 
So we will be talking about that. Uh, we will also going to be talking a little bit about what information you, the corporate compliance or audit executive, what you try to gather about your external audit firm and then bring that to your audit committee to help the committee better oversee the relationship with the external audit firm, and the financial statement audit, and what the audit committee publishes to investors. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of data that we'll be presenting you today. Uh, we'll be doing that shortly on both fronts. And then we will discuss what that data means with Mark and Cindy, uh, all for the ultimate goal of trying to get more value from and a better relationship with your audit firm. Uh, now, for those of you listening today, you will also be able to get uh, these, this data that we're talking about in a few different files that you can download. Uh, the Audit Transparency Barometer, which is from the CAQ, and the Audit Committee Survey from Compliance Week. Uh, we have also included a white paper we've drafted here at Compliance Week, uh, aptly called the Audit Committee White Paper. Uh, all three of those you can download by hitting the Event Resources option on the left-hand side of your screen. You will see a menu there, and you can download all of those. Uh, now, first, for starters, uh, Cindy, you are going to talk for a while about the Audit Transparency Project. Uh, so I will call up your slide, and uh, you can take it away. Great. Thank you so much. And again, I do want to thank Compliance Week for uh, inviting me to participate in this webcast, and it's a pleasure to be doing it with Mark at Audit Analytics, because as you mentioned, we've been working very closely together on this project. So what I want to do is just spend a few moments here at the outset to provide some context for our discussion and then the data points that uh, Mark and John will be covering later on in the program. Mm -hmm. Now, as you look at the next slide, one of the things that I think would help is if we kind of just level set as to what are the drivers of changes for audit committees. You know, over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of focus on the audit committee. And I think as everybody knows by now, uh, the roles and responsibilities of audit committees of public companies have been heightened since the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002. And so SOX explicitly mandated that the audit committee, not management, be directly responsible for appointing, compensating, and overseeing the external auditor. And then more recently, in the wake of the worldwide economic crisis, policymakers and regulators, not just here in the United States, but across the globe, have further increased their focus on the roles and contributions of audit committees. And just to give you a, a brief primer on that, uh, in May of 2014, SEC Chair Mary Jo White said, and I'm quoting here, the audit committee reporting requirements have not changed significantly in a number of years and I think it is time to take a look at whether improvements can be made. And that's a, that, that's a direct quote from her. So following on along that, in November of 2014, a newly minted SEC Chief Accountant Jim Schnur uh, announced that the SEC staff is in the process of drafting a concept release on audit committee disclosures. And we anticipate that that concept release will focus on additional required disclosures companies would have to make in their proxy statements, uh, particularly what audit committees will have to disclose. And again, some of them may be mandated and some may be voluntary. Uh, the SEC has said publicly that the concept release is set to be released soon, later this year. Uh, so we're hoping that that will happen in May or at least um, in the second quarter uh, of 2015, although, as a little aside, those of us that spend a lot of time in Washington soon in regulatory speak might have a different uh, concept than uh, it does for, for uh, many of us. <laughs> but um, this increased regulatory focus, be it by the SEC, uh, by other regulators across the globe, uh, really raises the stakes for audit committees and heightens the, needs, the need for all of us uh, in the process, in the financial reporting process, to think proactively. So one of the things that audit committee members think about and worry about is whether or not these recent regulatory initiatives and this focus, does that interfere with the important governance role that the audit committee has been charged with, um, both under Sarbanes-Oxley and since then? And, and an, Example of that would be the PCOB's contemplation of mandatory firm rotation. 
So it's, the audit committee community is definitely sitting up and paying attention to what's going on in the regulatory environment, as well as though what investors want, because at the end of the day, the audit committee stands in the shoes of investors, if you will. And so more and more, I think investors are taking notice and, and becoming more involved uh, in the audit committee's work. So you see investors calling for more interaction with the audit committees, whether it's from the largest investors wanting to have personal meetings with members of the boards of directors, and including the audit committee members, or if, they, if it's through the disclosures that the audit committee makes. And so uh, they really want to see the proxy statement be a communications tool and not a compliance regulatory or legal tool. So all of this means that investors are looking for a better understanding of the audit committee's work and also means that the audit committees are spending more time thinking about how to communicate better with investors. In the United States, looking back about what's going on here in the United States in particular, uh, one response to this interest in what audit committees are doing has been the audit committee collaboration. And so this was formed in 2012, uh, and it's the CAQ partnering with a number of organizations who have as their members um, audit committee members. So the National Association of Corporate Directors, uh, the Association of Audit Committee Members, the Directors Council, the New York Stock Exchange Governance Services, Tapestry Networks, and others have all partnered together with the CAQ to come up with this collaboration where we have and will continue to develop a number of tools and resources for audit committees. And the first of those was in uh, the, in 2012, was the Audit Committee Annual Evaluation Tool of the External Auditor. Uh, not a very um, pithy name, but certainly describes what the tool is. And, and it's mainly meant to help audit committees uh, objectively evaluate their auditor's performance on an annual basis or more frequently uh, if they decide, really to help them make an informed determination and a recommendation to the board as to the effectiveness of their auditors and whether the board should retain the auditor. And I might mention that um, all of the, the information, the tools, the resources that we're going to talk about today are available on the CAQ's website free of charge to the public, and that's www vcaqthecaq.org. So I would invite you to uh, take a look at that. Then the next project that the Audit Committee collaboration undertook was in November of 2013, where we released a report entitled Enhancing the Audit Committee Report, a Call to Action. And the call to action includes examples of emerging voluntary practices of strengthened audit committee disclosure. So, for example, it shows audit committees how they can clarify the scope of their duties, uh, how the audit committee can clearly define its composition, disclose the relevant factors that the audit committee considers when selecting not only an audit firm, but also the lead engagement partner. It talks about how the audit committee might disclose key factors when, con uh, when they compensate the external auditor, what factors they consider. Gives them examples of how to provide relevant information about how the audit committee oversees the external audit process, and also information about the evaluation of the external auditor, going back to that assessment tool we just talked about. I think it's particularly important to note that the call to action does not require audit committees to take on additional responsibilities, but rather to provide insights to investors and others about the work that they are already doing. And that's a key distinguisher, that it's not asking audit committees to do more. <coughs> Pardon me. 
And I also just want to point out very quickly that the examples highlighted in the report are not intended to represent all possible disclosures, but rather give uh, audit committee members concrete examples of what some of their peers are doing so that an audit committee, as they contemplate whether or not they want to enhance their disclosures, can see examples and know that they're not necessarily alone as they're going through uh, contemplating changing their disclosures. So the, the collaboration believes that effectively enhancing audit committee disclosures has a number of benefits. Um, one are, of course, there are benefits directly for investors. Uh, while a lot of the disclosure that is in the call to action can be found in audit committee charters, some investors have complained about the, uh, the, the treasure hunt that they have to go through to find this information, you know, be it in the charter, in the audit committee report, somewhere else in the proxy. So the call to action gives examples of how to consolidate all this information in the audit committee report. But of course, there are also benefits for audit committees as well, and it really helps them go through a process to look at their disclosures, and it, better communication of how audit committees fulfill their duties can demonstrate to regulators and lawmakers that ad additional regulation is not necessary, but rather that audit committees can do these things voluntarily so that you don't end up with a one-size-fits-all approach. Oftentimes, when you see regulation, uh, it is one-size-fits-all, and that's not necessarily helpful to an audit committee or to investors, but rather voluntary disclosures allow the audit committee to tailor the disclosures for their company at that particular point in time. Now, I don't want to make this sound like it's all rainbows and unicorns. There's obviously um, challenges that can come with enhancing disclosure. So we do have to be concerned about disclosure overload or information overload, and that's something that the SEC is looking at uh, amongst other projects under the umbrella of their uh, disclosure effectiveness project. But I do think that if you look at disclosures holistically, um, it does identify duplicative requirements and shows ways to simplify disclosure and even modernize uh, reporting so that investors, again, who all of this reporting is aimed at, have a more effective and efficient access point to the information that they need to make investing and voting decisions. And by performing a disclosure review, the audit committee should coordinate, of course, with the full board the offices of the corporate secretary and the general counsel, company management, many companies have a disclosure committee, and so all of these individuals and groups should be consulted as the audit committee goes about looking at its disclosures and ways that it may enhance uh, the disclosures to investors. So in addition to the call to action, we also, the audit, we also working very, very closely with Audit Analytics, which I was really pleased to be able to partner with them, uh, released in December of 2014 the Audit Committee Transparency Barometer. And in a minute, I'll turn it over to uh, Mark and, um, and John to discuss the barometer. But it was really important, we thought, to create a baseline uh, as to what audit committees are disclosing. And, and there have been a couple of studies over the last couple of years that focused on the Fortune 100 companies. But what we really wanted to do with audit analytics was look at audit committee disclosure across public companies of all sizes. So you'll see in the barometer uh, big cap, medium cap, and small cap company disclosures. And that we thought was really important. And then, as I mentioned, creating a baseline so that over time we can track trends and see where people are making these disclosures and try to get a handle on what's in, uh, effective. So uh, we, we hope it goes well beyond, we think it goes well beyond mere statistics. And providing the context around the disclosure, we think, can help build investor confidence, which is really important for our markets, obviously. So um, one thing that we thought we would include in there is the annual evaluation of the external auditor, since we had that uh, nifty tool that we created. So you will see that and a whole host of other information that's tracked in there. 
And so what I thought I should do, since they were so instrumental in creating the barometer, is turn it over to uh, Mark and John to discuss the particulars of the barometer and give you more of a flavor of the information that's in there. Sure. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, this is Matt Kelly here at Compliance Week, and we were just listening to Cindy Fornelli from the CAQ. Uh, as she said, we're going to shift gears a little bit now to talk more about the transparency barometer. Uh, that was developed by Audit Analytics. Before we get into a discussion of all that data with Cindy and Mark Sheffers, we're actually joined by uh, John Pekulik. He is one of the senior analysts and researchers at Audit Analytics. Uh, John was going to walk us through some of the data and the findings there. Uh, so John, uh, take it away for us, please. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me and for hosting this discussion. Mm -hmm. We're excited to share some of the key findings from the Audit Committee Transparency Barometer here. As Cindy was mentioning, the Transparency Barometer is really the culmination of a project, a joint project between the CAQ and Audit Analytics. The big picture is, as Cindy also mentioned, it's an analysis of what U.S. corporations are disclosing about the duties and activities of the Audit Committee, in particular what the Audit Committee is disclosing. And so to, to reiterate, we're trying to establish a baseline, a baseline of Audit Committee disclosure transparency. And to do this, we looked at the 2014 proxy statements of 1,500 S&P composite companies, namely the S&P 500, the S&P mid cap, and the S&P small cap. So this gives us a view not just of the top 100, top 500 companies, but really a broad picture of the entire reporting landscape. We looked at the Audit Committee report itself and also the, the proxy statement as a whole when we were going through trying to find what disclosures these Audit Committees were making. And what we found is that many companies are disclosing more than is required and many are consolidating their disclosures to minimize what Cindy referred to as the treasure hunt. So to give an idea of the kind of disclosure transparency we were looking for, we included here an interesting example. This is from the 2014 Audit Committee report of Vectron Corp, an S&P mid-cap company. In this example, they're talking about the things they considered when um, determining whether or not to reappoint their independent auditor. So reading from this disclosure then, the Audit Committee took into consideration a number of factors, including but not limited to the quality of the Audit Committee's ongoing discussions with the auditor, the auditor's independence, management's perceptions of the auditor's industry expertise and past performance, external data relating to audit quality and performance, including recent PCAOB reports on the auditor and its peer firms and lastly, the appropriateness of fees charged. We think this disclosure jibes pretty well with the CAQ's and the Audit Committee collaboration's call to action. Here there's a clear disclosure of relevant factors that the Audit Committee considers when engaging an audit firm. As you can see, among the factors considered by Vectron's Audit Committee include the industry expertise of the auditor, the external data about audit quality, and the appropriateness of fees. Other factors that we've seen in various disclosures include the auditor's legal risks and ongoing litigation and a, real, a rigorous fee benchmarking. One thing of note here is the use of external data in evaluating the auditor. This is something that we at Audit Analytics have some sp experience with. For example, our professional services group has advised a number of corporate clients on issues like this, including market intelligence, disclosure trends, and areas of reporting and disclosure risk, like financial restatements or control weaknesses. One thing we've seen is more requests coming in for industry-wide and peer group analysis regarding reporting trends, disclosure trends. And we think that this is possibly becoming something of a best practice and that companies are responding to the call to action about what they're disclosing regarding the audit committee's uh, scope and duties. 
Okay, so let's turn now to a summary of the findings in the transparency barometer. Here you can see a breakdown of the really the main questions that we were looking for when we were analyzing the audit committee reports and the proxy statements. Generally, we separated out the disclosures into four categories. The first one is audit firm selection. The second is auditor compensation. Third, auditor evaluation and supervision. And lastly, the selection of the audit partner. I should note here that these percentages going down the right side of the table there represent disclosures made in the entire proxy. So this is not just the audit committee report, but the proxy as a whole. And what we did here is simply count whether or not the company made a disclosure along the lines that are uh, along the lines in the disclosure questions there in the middle in the middle column. So the first the first question you can see is there a discussion of audit committee considerations in appointing the auditor in terms of qualifications, geographic reach, or firm expertise? Now in our analysis, again of 2014 proxy statements, 13% of the S&P 500, 10% of mid cap, and 8% of small cap companies had a disclosure to that effect. This is essentially the disclosure that Vectron Corp was making in the example in the previous slide. Now when you go through these findings, you can see there are a couple that are high across the board, large companies, medium companies, and small companies, relatively speaking, are, disclose, are making these disclosures at a high rate. So the second one, does the company or does the audit committee disclose the length of time the auditor has been engaged, that is auditor tenure? Uh, nearly half of all the companies that we analyzed made a disclosure of the auditor tenure. Another question or disclosure with high disclosure rates across the board is the fifth one down under, or the third one under auditor compensation rather. Is there a discussion of how non-audit services may impact independence? This is interesting and you can see the response rates are quite high, 83%, 69%, and 58% for small, medium, and small company, large, medium, and small companies. On the other hand, there are a couple of cases where the disclosure rate is quite small. For example, also under auditor compensation, is there a discussion of how the audit committee considers auditor compensation? Now that's one of the uh, really fundamental requirements of the audit committee according to the regulations. And the number of companies that disclose what their considerations are in compensating the auditor is very small, 1%, 1%, and 0%. Another one with somewhat low participation rates is under auditor evaluation and supervision. Is there a disclosure of significant areas addressed with the auditor? Now that's something that could provide a lot of insight into what's going on behind the scenes to investors. It may run the risk, as Cindy mentioned, of information overload, but it could possibly also present a lot of benefits. But only 3% of large companies, 2% of medium, and 1% of small companies disclose a consideration of the significant areas addressed with the auditor. Lastly, before we move on, there are a couple of cases where the disclosure rates vary significantly between large companies and small companies. So for example, the last two here in this table under the selection of audit partner, is it stated that the engagement partner rotates every five years? 16% of large companies explicitly state that, whereas only 3% of medium and 4% of small companies disclose the same thing. Is it explicitly stated that the audit committee is involved in the selection of the audit engagement partner? 13% of large companies explicitly state that, whereas only 1% of medium and small companies disclose something to that effect. And lastly, there's one more that we'd like to note that has a high low relationship there between large companies and small companies, and that is, is there a discussion of audit fees and its connection to audit quality? 13% of large companies, 4% of medium, and 1% of small cap companies. So that is a summary really of the findings of the Audit Committee Transparency Barometer. I should point out that later this year we will have an update 
for the 2015 proxy statements, and we'd have, we'll have now something to compare it to. So we'll be able to see, as Cindy mentioned, the trends in these, in these report, in these disclosures. Thank you, Matt. All right. Uh, thank you, John. We appreciate uh, all of that data. And again, everybody, that was John Pekulik. He is one of the analysts at Audit Analytics. He was talking about some of the data that they had found in their transparency barometer. Uh, we're now going to shift to maybe about 15 or 20 minutes of just Q&A and jawboning about the data that we have found here. Uh, we're going to be talking with Cindy Fornelli, Director of the Center for Audit Quality, and Mark Cheffers, Chief Executive of Audit Analytics. Um, I'm going to throw these questions out in no particular order, but Mark, I did want to give you the first question. One thing I saw from the transparency barometer that you had prepared um, was that you know, there is many more, much more data in the whole report. I encourage everybody to download it and read it if you can. But clearly, audit committees are Disclose, many more audit committees are now disclosing many more things. You guys compared 2012 to 2014, and across many different metrics you looked at, there's a whole lot more audit committees giving out information. Um, and I was just wondering if you could you know, offer some thoughts about why that is. And Cindy, I'll follow up with you afterwards there, but Mark, what do you think is going on here driving the audit committees? Well, interesting question, Matt. The, um, I mean, I think Put simply, I mean, audit committees have significant levels of fiduciary and statutory obligations. They have more than other board members. Um, they have responsibilities essentially not just for auditor oversight, which is one of the things that we're talking about today, but they also have, they also have um, regulatory responsibilities to identify what I would call at-risk accounting areas. Um, they need to be informed not just from management or even from their auditor about what the at-risk uh, accounting areas are, but they also need to be independently informed. They need to find some sort of um, independent source. Um, the <clears throat> I thought it was um, um, interesting that Cindy raised um, Chairman White's uh, quote, and I have another one from her, um, quote, I can't overstate the importance of the audit committee functioning at the highest possible level, end quote. <clears throat> now this to me foreshadows what I would consider to be increasing amounts of um, fiduciary and statutory obligations coming their way. And Cindy, um, maybe this is something we could talk about, but um, you know, I admire the CAQ's efforts um, at uh, what I would call trying to enhance um, transparency uh, of the activities of the audit committee without, in fact, enhancing the amount of work they have to do. Now, I'm really not at all sure that can be done, and um, maybe as this question and answer goes back and forth, um, I can maybe play a little bit of uh, what I would call, you know, kind of the, um, I don't know, uh, place a little bit more of a kind of a dour view of that. Um, so, Cindy, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but um, I'm 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 feeling a little bit like um, audit committees are are about to get more and more responsibility and more and more exposure. Cindy, what do you think about that? Well, I think Mark is on to something here. Um, you know, after the financial crisis, uh, regulators, Congress, uh, almost everybody, financial press, looked at everybody's roles and responsibilities. And, and I think that, uh, you know, what the general consensus was that everybody could have done a better job. Mm -hmm. And so the audit committee community has not really seen significant uh, regulation since 1999, which predates Sarbanes-Oxley. So uh, if you look at the SEC's rules and, and the New York Stock Exchange and other exchanges listing rules, there hasn't really been significant change since 1999. And then in 2002, you had uh, this massive legislation that required a lot more of the audit committee. And so I think what Mary Jo White and others are doing are taking a step back and saying, you know, how can we 
and what should we do to uh, increase the performance of audit committees? Now, I happen to think that, in general, audit committees do a very good job. But um, as you look at the barometer uh, and some of the other work that Audit Analytics does, there's, what, 7,000 plus public companies in the United States? And so not every audit committee can perform at the highest levels as the best audit committees in the country. And so I think helping audit committees uh, up their game and those that need improvement upping their, their game, but those that are doing a good job explaining what they're doing is an important function, which is why we were so pleased with the work that audit analytics did in the barometer to help demonstrate some of these best practices on disclosures. So, Cindy, let me also just follow up a bit, and then Mark, I'd like to get your thoughts as well, that, um, you know, I, I agree that the audit committees are struggling with a lot, but, you know, once upon a time, the audit committee mostly wor worried about audits, and now we see they are getting a lot of duties that are important, but FCPA risk, uh, other anti-corruption issues, risk management, we all know cybersecurity will also be placed on their agenda pretty much because the SEC said they have to put cybersecurity somewhere. I can't think of anywhere else to put it. Let's stick it with the audit committee. And I'm kind of wondering how much these sort of non-traditional duties are crowding out what had once upon a time been the day job of just keeping an eye on the financial audit, which is enough work unto itself. I mean, I mean is there a certain amount of throwing everything into the kitchen sink at these guys and they're, they're getting overwhelmed? Well, Matt, you, you, you used a phrase that, or close to a phrase that I've used before, which I think sometimes gets misunderstood, but I have in the past likened the audit committee to the kitchen junk drawer. Yep. Um, because in my kitchen, at least, all the important things that I need, keys, batteries, um, important documents, reside in the kitchen junk drawer. And I do fear that audit committees sometimes get um, – all of the, the high-profile, high-risk areas uh, that might be better considered by the whole board. I've heard Ken Daly uh, describe cyber, for instance, as a uh, full-team sport, that you need all the players on the team, all of your bench strength, looking at cybersecurity risks. And so I, I think the important thing is uh, because I think it's a bit inevitable that the audit committee may be tasked not only with cyber, but risk management and other areas in addition to uh, the financial reporting oversight, that there be really clear, crisp definition of who's on point for what. So if the audit committee is going to take on primary responsibility for overseeing cyber, that needs to be clearly spelled out so that um, there's, there's not one of these situations where the audit committee thinks that they have a slice of cyber, but the full board thinks that the audit committee is significantly or primarily responsible for cyber risk. So I, I think one way to do that is to have a better definition and better delineation of the roles and responsibilities within the board so that everybody knows who the champion of each one of those risks are. Mark, what do you think about the uh, overwhelming, the, the overwhelmed audit committee these days? Um, well, it used to be that we would get questions from people preparing audit committees or audit committees about, you know, fee benchmarking or um, more recently um, the uh, PCOB inspection reports, data related to those and their peer groups. Um, we get market share questions because audit committees were interested in finding out, you know, what market share each firm had in their particular industry. Pretty, what I would call kind of pretty normal stuff. <clears throat> but more recently, we've been getting questions about, about uh, cyber data, about things like a lot more about accounting complexity, about um, um, litigation, um, about um, se Section 404 controls, Section 302 um, deficiencies amongst their peers, um, some questions about the implications of accounting estimates, impairments, out-of-period adjustments, and of course restatements. <clears throat> um, so what we're finding is that the, it 
seemingly the the need to get kind of some sort of peer related data that can be summarized quickly um, as is forming more of the basis upon which the audit committees um, they, they want to have a discussion with the auditors about these matters, and they want to have it have be able to report to the full board about them. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think some of that has to do with this idea that I was talking about earlier about kind of at-risk accounting um, areas, and that the the um, I mean one of the things that the uh, concept release from the SEC was looking at, or one of the complaints they were looking at, was for example. Um, you know, audit committee members may have less training or experience than the auditors who the audit committee oversees. And I think that's an interesting question. I don't know if that means, you know, anything that may not be a good or a bad thing, but um, that's certainly something they were looking at. And the, um, also that the, uh, you know, the work of the audit committee, this goes back to the transparency aspect, you know, doesn't really appear in the financial statements, only in the proxy statement, and only to the extent that it has thus far. Now, uh, in fact, let me turn it back to you because my next kind of, my next kind of, uh, I don't know, projection about how bad this can get and how bad it's going to get um, will come from the, the now requirements, um, pending requirements for audit committees in the EU and the, and, the, and the pending requirements for the new expanded audit report, which is going to place just tremendous um, burdens on the audit committee. So anyway, without being too depressing, I'll turn it back to you, Matt. Maybe you can... Uh, All right. Well, you know, I'll see if I can explore some other dark clouds that might be gathering in other <laughs> ways here. Um, we have been talking for a while now about what information the audit committee discloses to the investing public in the world in uh, the proxy statement. I wanted to shift gears just a bit to talk about what information compliance and audit executives, so like the people listening to this webcast, what they are trying to bring to the audit committee so they internally can have a good discussion about here's what we want to do to oversee our audit committee, our audit engagement well. Um, that is the audit committee survey I mentioned earlier that Compliance Week itself has done. Uh, we did not present any of that data in these slides here. I just wanted to queue up one or two factoids and present them to you both and get your reaction. Um, one of them was that 60% of the, the compliance executives who took our own survey, 60% said they don't do any peer review of their industry peers and their audit engagements. They, they don't do any of that when they go talk to their own audit committees about engaging a firm. Uh, they also found, we found that across the board, there's all sorts of different data about audit firms, SEC comment letters, restatements, you know, things like that, that they would like to bring to their audit committees to discuss, to find out is this firm a good fit for us or not. That's what they want to do, but actually, most of them, the only data they actually bring to the audit committee is an audit fee analysis, which is fairly straightforward to do. So I guess my question, maybe Mark, I'll pose it first to you and then Cindy to you as well. Um, do we not have enough visibility into what data there are about you know, what makes a good audit firm or a good audit quality or a good quality audit engagement? You know, it, it seems to me like a lot of compliance executives are struggling to find the right information to bring to their audit committee to have a good discussion about this is what we want in an audit firm. They don't really, they don't know what that is yet. Do, do, do you think that's accurate? Well, you know, I, I actually think that, you know, most audit firms are pretty good about bringing this kind of information to the audit committee members, understanding that they have lots of responsibilities mm -hmm. and they need to be um, kept abreast of things and they need to answer some of these questions that may come from the other board members. Yep. So I do think that, you know, there's probably a lot of informal discussion about these kinds of things. <clears throat> the, um, um, the, the idea of bringing additional data points to the question of kind of auditor quality. Um, I think that's a, you know, well, I, I think it's, it, it's just an, it's, to me it's an evolution. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Um, and um, the, um, this, this idea, for, actually let me give you one example. Um, sure. Presently, 
the audit committee is responsible for identifying the kinds of or the import of the accounting policies that have been employed by the company. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're reflected in the first footnote of every financial statement, and they're pretty expansive. Now, one of the responsibilities of the audit committee under current regulations is to is to examine those ch policy accounting policy items with respect to their peers to try to get a sense of you know whether they're aggressive whether they're kind of middle of the road whether they're different if they're different how they're different well that's to me is kind of like the nose you know the camel's nose under the tent once you've given the audit committee the responsibility to essentially assess what I would call areas of accounting, again, risk um, and disclosure risk, then if information is available about things like, okay, what, what, kinds of, what kind of accounting and financial reporting failures or questions, for example, with SEC comment letters, are coming for their peers, um, and then if, it seems quite natural that that would be the next step in that uh, the idea of like how do we how do we as an audit committee acquit this responsibility about policy mm -hmm. and <clears throat> so um, let me actually let me turn it to Cindy so I don't keep going on here but uh, Cindy yeah let me pose the question to you as well um, what sort of data do you think companies should be looking at you know audit executives consulting with their own audit committees what kind of data did, should they be looking at to determine this is a good sort of audit engagement for us? We know we've got something quality here. Yeah, well, unfortunately, as Mark uh, alluded to, there, there's not a lot of data out there. Yep. Um, and so uh, you can look at fees, uh, which I don't necessarily think is a good, it, it's certainly an important factor, but it's not dispositive. And then uh, really the only other piece of data that you have is restatements and inspection reports. And um, given that the PCOB's inspections process is risk-based, where they're looking at the riskiest areas, mm -hmm. and the numbers that we see are very high, um, because they're looking at the high-risk areas, uh, those aren't necessarily good indicators for audit committees and compliance executives uh, to help determine who the best auditor for that company at that particular time is. So one of the things that we've been working on at the CAQ is a set of audit quality indicators that would be a suite of about 12 indicators that the engagement team would go in and talk to the audit committee and management about um, you know, where they fit in these areas of these indicators. And that they're, they're roughly um, uh, spread out evenly among tone at the top uh, of the, the firm, of the audit firm, so how the firm tries to drive home both at the top, the middle, and the bottom of the organization, their core values. There's also um, a bucket talking about the experience, knowledge, and um, uh, education of the engagement team. So there are a couple of metrics there. Then there's these, because they are important, the inspection reports and the restatements, there's those external uh, factors as well as internal factors uh, along the lines of the firm's system of quality controls and their own internal inspections and their reporting. So the goal here is that the engagement team would have a robust conversation with the audit committee and others about uh, what their own indicators are, their own metrics are, uh, so that the audit committee can get a better feel and can look at things in addition to uh, just the inspection reports. And we're hoping that over time, more and more engagement teams will have these conversations voluntarily with the audit committee, and that eventually we may even see, as we continue on with the barometer, we may even see some audit committees um, talking about and disclosing uh, in the proxy and in the audit committee report uh, that they're looking at audit quality indicators so that investors can get a sense, too, that it's not just the fees and the inspection reports that the audit committee is left to analyze, but that there are other more robust uh, indicators, too, of audit quality. All right. And so we've got about five more minutes left here. Time for maybe one more question I wanted to pose. And uh, Cindy, since you mentioned 
the PCAOB and the inspection reports, uh, somebody had asked this question, I know the PCAOB is trying to referee tensions between internal and external auditors about how much evidence needs to be collected for audits over internal controls, and the PCAOB is saying the audit committee should be the referee and the parent who spells out a good working relationship between the sibling rivalry here. Uh, could any of your efforts here help the audit committee do that job? Um, and I know I've heard a lot of talk about that. Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I think that the frustration that you hear uh, on this area by audit committee members is that they are having to referee this relationship between the external and the internal audit. And, you know, that's an important relationship uh, between the internal auditors and the external auditors. And really the, the, the three parties, uh, internal audit, external audit, and the audit committee, really do form the backbone of the financial reporting process and the information that investors can use to help them make both voting and investment decisions. And so um, it is frustrating when uh, those parties aren't communicating uh, robustly with one another and amongst one another. So I think part of this was maybe caused by the PCOB issued a practice alert, practice alert number 11, mm -hmm. um, late last year, in the fall of last year. And I think a lot of it, it, it reminded auditors of what their responsibilities were and how much they could rely on the work of others, and particularly in high-risk areas. And I think part of the angst that that caused was because of the timing of it. Um, the PCOB would tell you that, that they did not change the standard, that they were just reminding auditors of their current uh, performance standards. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the timing of it raised questions and, because it came so late in the process that um, that might have caused some of the confusion. So I think maybe next year you'll see a smoother process. But I think it's really important that the audit committee sit down with internal audit and external audit and determine who's going to do what and plan out the audit. So it needs to happen frequently, but it also needs to happen early so that everybody's clear on what their roles and responsibilities are and where the external audit is going to rely on internal audit and when they're going to have to go and do uh, the testing on their own. All right. Uh, well, we are out of time on the Q&A right now, so uh, we will need to wrap up. But uh, again, everybody, our speakers were Cindy Fornelli, Director of the Center for Audit Quality, and Mark Cheffers, Exec Chief Executive of Audit Analytics. Uh, thank you both. You covered a lot of ground for us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, Matt. Matt. Sure. And also earlier we heard from John Pakulik from Audit Analytics as well, presenting some of the data that we had. Uh, just some final wrap-up notes for all of our listeners. This webcast has been recorded, and it will be available sometime in the next hour or so on the Compliance Week archives. Uh, CPE credit is now available to Compliance Week subscribers for archived webcasts. Uh, please check out our on-demand CPE library under the webcast tab at complianceweek.com. Uh, for everybody else who has been listening live uh, and you want the CPE credit, once again, to obtain your CPE credit after this presentation, wait until I wrap up. Uh, please disable the pop-up blockers in order to access the exam, any pop-up blockers you might have on your web browser. Uh, the webcast will then close automatically. The final exam will present itself automatically in a separate window on your computer screen. You can take the test then. If you have any trouble viewing the test or receiving your CPE certificate, please send an email to info at compliancewweek.com to request a copy. Uh, and one last plug for our annual conference. If you enjoyed this presentation and are interested in learning more about topics like it, uh, please visit our annual conference website, conference.complianceweek.com. To learn more about our 2015 conference, that's going to be Washington, D.C., May 18 to 20. And yes, we will be discussing some audit committee issues and PCAOB inspections and all that other fun stuff that is definitely on our agenda as well. Uh, so that concludes this webcast for today. I'm Matt Kelly, editor of Compliance Week. Thank you all for joining us, and goodbye. <laughs>